So we've now learned a little bit about learning and about memory, and we're going to delve more into memory. There are two types of memory, implicit memory and explicit memory. Implicit memory is unconscious memory. Subjects can demonstrate knowledge, such as a skill, conditioned response, or recalling events on prompting, but they cannot explicitly retrieve the information. So you, most of you, know how to drive, but if you were try to explicitly and consciously retrieve your knowledge of how to drive, that would be really quite challenging and near impossible. Explicit memory, on the other hand, is conscious memory. Subjects can retrieve an item and indicate that they know that the retrieved item is the correct item. So they have source memory, they remember when something occurred, um, and uh, details information about the time, place, stuff like that. Those two types of memory align with the two categories of memory, declarative memory and procedural memory. Declarative memory is the ability to recount what one knows, to detail the time, place, and circumstances of events. Declarative memory is often lost in amnesia. Procedural memory is the ability to recall a movement sequence or how to perform some act or behavior. From a practical point of view, there is little difference between the implicit explicit distinction and the procedural declarative distinction. So, declarative memory largely aligns with explicit memory, and implicit memory largely aligns with procedural memory. To just review the two categories of memory and some terms that are associated with each, explicit aligns with declarative, so this is generally conscious memory for facts. This is generally what you think of when you think of memory. You know that something happened, there's location information, you have conscious recollection, you can elaborate on what you know. There's memory with record, meaning that you can look back and think about the circumstances or the, the events that might have led up to you knowing something or learning something. There's autobiographical elements, it's representational, uh, there's episodic, meaning it has time and place, semantic, this can be general knowledge, facts that you know, and there's working memory. And working memory is generally the information that you're consciously thinking of right now. It could be the stuff that you're listening to and learning about as part of this course, and you could also have the little bits and pieces of information that are going on in the back of your mind, like your to-do list, or trying to remember a couple of things to do after you finish watching this lecture. Unconscious memory is implicit, and it is generally non-declarative. There's skills, habits, knowing how to do something. So you know how to ride a bike. But if you were to declare all aspects or try to describe all aspects of your memory surrounding learning how to ride a bike, you really wouldn't be able to do so. Implicit and non-declarative memory has a taxon. That means it can be organized hierarchically. There's skills. You can have the integration of skills. This would be memory without record. So again, you know how to ride a bike but you don't actually have any conscious recall of all the individual tiny memory pieces that built up to that skill. It is perceptual in nature, so it has to do, it is largely aligned with uh, the senses. There can be dispositional differences. It's procedural, so stepwise learning in terms of what then what. Uh, it is non-associative, and it is reference. So this list of paired terms is usually used, used by theorists to differentiate conscious from unconscious memory. So the main things that you want to figure out is what distinguishes explicit and declarative memory from implicit and non-declarative memory. So when we're processing our memories, we have short-term memory. Short-term memory is just a few minutes in duration. This involves the frontal lobes. So this would basically be the equivalent of remembering a phone number, someone giving you directions to remember, trying to remember a shopping list without any other information, 
little bits and pieces of information that you're just trying to recall for a few minutes and you don't actually need the information long term. Long term memory has indefinite duration and it involves the temporal lobes. One thing I do, I talked about short term memory as something that's a few minutes in duration. You can be trying to rehearse or learn things in short term memory, some that you want to keep that would move into long term memory and some that you don't really quite care about. You might need to know, like remember the steps of a recipe while you're walking from uh, the recipe book to across the kitchen to enact some of those steps, but you don't actually need to remember that information, you know, long term. Other things you really do want to try to learn for the long term. This would be like when you're studying for this class or other types of classes where some of the information is starting in short term memory and you're practicing it and recalling it and trying to learn about it in sort of shorter duration. But your goal is to have that short term memory transition to long term memory. Long term memory involves the temporal lobes, specifically the hippocampus. The hippocampus is very important for turning short term memories into long term memories. One thing I want to make clear is that there is no single place in the nervous system that can be identified as the location of a memory or learning a particular piece of information. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind was quite inaccurate in that regard. You cannot go in and remove individual memories. Your memories are distributed throughout your entire cortex. So personal memories is generally what we tend to think of also when we think about memory, the memories that make us who we are, our own experiences. These types of personal memories are known as episodic memories. These are autobiographical memories for events, and they are pegged to specific place and time context. So when we think back about things that we've done in our lives, those memories have a time and a place context that are very, very integral to the memory and the memory representation. Those time and place contexts make a particular circumstance or a particular memory autobiographical and episodic. Episodic amnesia is highly rare. Uh, the type of Hollywood amnesia is what it's called. It is typically oftentimes displayed in movies where someone would have a bump to the head and then they would no longer remember anything about who or what they were. That has, there's never been a case in the history of science so far that actually maps on to that type of Hollywood amnesia. If you were to have such extensive damage that you didn't know who you are, which is known as episodic amnesia, then the damage would have to be very, very extensive. There is one patient, patient KC, who comes a little bit close. So he had an inability to recall any personally experienced events. And this was associated with frontal lobe injuries or reduced blood flow to the frontal lobes. Largely, when you have episodic amnesia, it's linked with dementia. But just like experiences with dementia, that tends to be stuff that you've lost specific types of episodic memories or specific episodic memories. It's not like you have total episodic amnesia where you don't have any idea, who am I? Where did I come from? I'm, you know, I'm a character in this movie and I just have a slight bump to my head. I've lost all my memories. But aside from that, everything is fine. All of my cognitive functions are fine. I'm just as beautiful an actor as actress as I ever was. That type of amnesia is highly, highly inaccurate. The type of episodic amnesia that is a little bit more accurate is that associated with uh, frontal dementia, where you have the decline and impairment of the frontal lobes, and it can result in selective amnesia, a loss of information from your past that can become more and more pervasive. And if anyone has experience with that type of loss of memory from dementia, then uh, you would know that there is nothing remotely Hollywood or romantic about it. It is extremely debilitating. And people that have the sort of those loss of those personal memories become very disjointed in time and space, they can become very disoriented, and then, then they can't really function normally. The frontal lobes are highly relevant for retrieval of 
information from our memories. And in this way, our frontal lobes allow us to actually mentally travel through our past. We can think about things that happened in the past. We can link particular past events together. So our frontal lobes in this regard are highly important for retrieval and reconstruction of memories. So if we have damage to our frontal lobes, then we can have lots of trouble retrieving memories from the other parts of our cortex. Amnesia, and we'll be talking about this more, is partial or total loss of memory. People with amnesia perform normally on tests of implicit memory, but not on explicit memory. And I'll talk about this more. In trying to delve into where memory comes from in the brain, Carl Lashley searched in vain for quite a long time for the neural circuits underlying memories. He didn't really find any. He just found that the severity of the memory disturbance was related to the size of the injury rather than its location. So the more intensive and invasive and debilitating the injury, the more, the greater the loss of memory. Another very important scientist that greatly informed the, our understanding of memory and how memory formation occurs uh, is the famous patient H.M., known as Henry Molaisen. Scoville performed a bilateral medial temporal lobe resection on Henry. Uh, this was for retractable epilepsy. So his seizures were very, very bad. The seizures originated in the region that includes the amygdala, hippocampal formation, and associated subcortical structures. So Scoville, in an attempt to treat his very debilitating seizures, removed both by medial temporal lobe regions on each side of the brain. When he removed all of those, he removed his hippo the, the hippocampus and the structures that were critical for the formation of new memories. So what happened is that following surgery, HM suffered from some severe amnesia. He could not recall anything that happened after the surgery. So while he could remember his childhood, anything that happened after the surgery, he had no explicit memory of. And that's very key. He had no explicit memory of those things. Despite this deficit, HM had above average IQ, he performed well on perceptual tests, and he could still recall events from his childhood, as I had said. HM's performance on implicit memory tests was also left intact. So what this means is that he can learn how to do new things, but he would not have any memory of actually learning to do those things. So let's just say that HM had never ridden a bike before. And so after his surgery, he would have no recollection then if a bike were to be put in front of him of having ever encountered this bike before or having ridden it, just as if he were to introduce him to a person after his surgery. After a few minutes passed and he lost his concentration, he would have no knowledge or memory of ever meeting that person before. But what they found out is that they could still teach HM a number of things. So getting back to our bike riding example, if you brought this bike in front of HM and you said, here, we're going to teach you how to ride the bike, HM would say, I've never ridden a bike before, I have no idea. And then you can say, you know what, just try it. We don't expect anything, just get on the bike and try and see how you do. And he would try a little bit and he might get some balance or some rhythm. And uh, then you could come back the next day and HM would say, I've never ridden a bike before. I don't know how to ride a bike. And you could say, you know what? Just get on the bike. Let's just see what you can do. And you could repeat this procedure for multiple, multiple days until HM had basically spent 20 to 30 days practicing riding a bike, and yet he never had any memory of actually doing so. What would happen is that just as for a normal person practicing, practicing riding a bike or practicing any sort of skill is that his performance would improve over time. So he would get better and better at riding this bicycle even though he had no memory of ever having ridden a bike. So you could then on the 30th day for example tell HM, look here's a bike, let's ride it. And he would say I've never ridden a bicycle before. And you would say you know what Let's just try it. Let's just see how you were to balance if you were to try it for your very first time. And HM could then get on the bike and start riding around the room, something along those lines. So while he had no conscious memory of having ever 
ridden a bike, his muscles and still learned and procedural memory was still intact. So he was still able to acquire habits, acquire skills, acquire procedural knowledge. So while he had no explicit or declarative memory, his implicit or procedural memory remained intact following his surgery. Patient JK, he had the opposite. He had impaired implicit memory with intact explicit memory. So he developed Parkinson's disease in his mid-70s and started to have memory problems at 78 years of age. So this resulted to damage to the basal ganglia. He had an impaired ability to perform tasks that he had done all of his life. So we could take the opposite example. We could say, look, you've ridden a bike to work for 20 years and suddenly you can't do it anymore. But he could still remember all those times that he had ridden his bike to work. Uh, another example would just be turning off the radio. He had known that he had listened to the radio all his life, but he would just forget how to do basic procedural skills, basic procedural knowledge. So he could still recall all the explicit events. So this relationship between HM and an intact temporal lobe and JK, an intact basal ganglia, this is an example of a double dissociation. That if you have damage to the temporal lobes, then you're going to have a loss of explicit memory. But if you have damage to the basal ganglia, then you're going to have a loss of implicit memories. Here are the two basic patterns of amnesia, and you'll definitely want to know these. So here, if you have your time point of brain injury, okay? So here's the future, and here's the past. So if you have anterograde amnesia right here, this would be an inability to form new memories. This would occur following damage to your temporal lobe, specifically your hippocampus. An inability to access old memories would be known as retrograde amnesia, but it's mostly incomplete. So unlike the Hollywood amnesia that I described that's impossible where you don't remember anything, there is some retrograde amnesia that is quite common surrounding a point of trauma. So if you were to get into a car accident, for example, and you had a concussion as part of that time and you had some trauma to your brain, then you would likely have a little bit of retrograde and a little bit of anterograde amnesia surrounding the event. That means that you might not remember a couple of the things that happened the days or even possibly a week before, and you might not also remember a couple of things that happened right after the event as well. Okay, so this is known as temporally graded amnesia that immediately surrounding the point of damage, then the amnesia is most severe, but as the distance from the damage in terms of time increases, then the amnesia becomes less severe. So most of the time, this sort of Hollywood retrograde amnesia is literally going to be a loss of memories that might be a um, week, a month, maybe even some as far out as a year are surrounding a very traumatic uh, point of brain injury, such as brain surgery, being in active combat where you have traumatic brain injury. So the events and memories that would be closest to the traumatic event would be lost, whereas the ones that were oldest from the past would be preserved. So we have two then types of amnesia, anterograde amnesia, an inability to form new memories, and retrograde amnesia, an inability to access older memories. So we have different neural circuits for emotional memories. Emotional memories are quite special because of the affective properties of the stimuli or events. Emotional memories can be implicit or explicit, and the amygdala is critical for emotional memory. So classical conditioning, for example, uh, parts of it can be implicit where your body, or your conscious body might not actually be aware of the fact that you are learning some of the stuff that you're learning, uh, but they can also have explicit components. So an example that I gave in the past in an earlier lecture is how I talked about how I had gone to the dentist one time 
and I hadn't been in a little bit and I had to have a cavity filled uh, behind my front teeth. These are quite unusual cavities in the sense that they have a different type of shot. You know, the Novocaine shot goes under the nose and those shots are quite painful. So I had the, the shot um, to numb my teeth and the dentist started working and I could still feel all of the work that was being done on my teeth. And I'm just, again, presenting the scenario and reminding um, you of this example that I gave. And, uh, but I could still feel everything, so the dentist tried again to give me another shot, but they couldn't find my facial nerve for whatever uh, reason it was. And so they had started to uh, go inside the tooth to uh, clean out the cavity, but it was extremely painful. But they'd already started, so they kind of needed to finish. So I basically ended up having to have the, the cavities filled without any Novocaine. It was so painful. And it was so upsetting that, of course, I was just trying to get through the office visit. I was crying, and I was very upset. And, of course, the dentist was like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So I had this one event happen. It was this very strong negative association with the, with the dentist. And even though I don't have any sort of fear of the dentist, I've been to that dentist before, and I've been to many different types of dentists, so I did not actually have a fear of dental care. Six months later, when I needed to have my teeth cleaned for just a basic checkup, I walked into the dentist's office, not really expecting anything, but as soon as I walked into the office, I just burst into tears, okay? So this is a really good example of how my body had done learning implicitly. I wasn't actually even aware that my body had formed this such a strong association that as soon as I walked into the office, I started crying, but I couldn't figure myself figure out why it was. It's like, why am I crying? I don't understand. And then it hit me that I had realized that, of course, I was here, you know, six months earlier, and I had that negative uh, experience, and so I had the explicit recollection of what had happened. So the amygdala is critical for both of those types of emotional memories, for implicit associations that occur without us being aware of it, and for the enhancement of explicit memories. We tend to be very mindful of and have a very high, uh, higher than normal memory for emotional events or things that are very arousing to us. Damage to the amygdala can actually abolish emotional memory, but it also but it has little effect on implicit or explicit memories more generally. So if you have damage to the amygdala or you remove it, then you basically won't get any of the enhanced memory for emotional stimuli that can occur. So you won't get any sort of enhanced association forming for emotional information, or you won't have any of the enhanced sort of more detail-oriented memories that can occur surrounding emotional content. But your body will still form basic implicit associations and explicit memories.